All right, we'll call the meeting to order for the first select board meeting of November 2019, November 4th. Uh, if somebody would like to make a motion to approve the agenda, unless there's any additions. Or I'd like to add. I'd like to add something. Okay. Um, I'd like to add um, some information that I have about speed bumps versus speed tables, <clears throat> also called the speed hump, okay. um, in relation to uh, Guptor Road. Is there any other additions or changes? Seeing none, hearing none. Tell me to make a motion to approve the agenda. Would that change? To make a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. Uh, no further discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Next on the list is the consent agenda item, which is just simply the minutes of meeting minutes of October 7th and October 10th meetings. Somebody would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda, please. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda item. Is there second. a second? Okay, Mike, uh, motion's been made and seconded. All those who wish to approve the consent agenda items, please say aye. 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 Public is the next thing on the agenda. Is there anybody from the public wishes to speak at this time? <coughs> go ahead, Steve. Oh, can I go to the mic? Sure. Okay. So, I mean, you want to get And yeah. is this on? Uh, so. No. So I just I wanted to make an announcement. Um, and let everybody know that uh, the Community Center Feasibility Study has started. Uh, we hired uh, GBA Architecture and Planning, as you know, and we have a public meeting that uh, has been scheduled for Tuesday, November 19th, and uh, it's going to be here in this room from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, they're terming a listening meeting. Uh, it's basically to uh, present sites that uh, they've looked at, narrowed down, and then hear from the general public uh, about their uh, ideas about a community center. So I just wanted to make that announcement and I'll send the flyer out to you as well. We have a flyer here. What date was that, Steve? It's um, November Tuesday, November 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. And it will be here in the room. We'll be serving refreshments. And um, so our steering committee and GBA architecture is going to be uh, we're all going to be leading the meeting, basically. Thanks. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else? Seeing no one, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Consider an appointment of the zoning administrator. <coughs> Dina. That must be you. Well, Dina is the zoning administrator, but right. I'll, I'll tee it up. Okay. Um, yeah. <coughs> First. Okay. So, um, Dina has been our zoning administrator for a little bit more than three years now, and uh, well, a little bit more than that since uh, so three years and six or seven months maybe, um, and the um, somebody wrote an email to me back in. August, I think it was, maybe September, uh, but I believe it was August, and uh, asked a few questions about what was happening in the zoning office. They had a few concerns. And um, when they, when they uh, exchanged uh, information with me and I, I took that question into mind, it jogged my memory that I said, oh, the zoning administrator has a term appointment that she's Zoning administrator is the only employee, uh, only employee that's not elected that has a, a term of office, as opposed to you're hired and then you know you you have your job until you resign it or are removed from it. But the zoning administrator has a, a three-year term, so 
I went and talked with Carla and realized that uh, Dina's term expired in uh, March 1st of this year. And now it was August, so I said, well, okay, do we have a zoning administrator? So I called Joe McLean of Stitzel and Page's office and explained what had happened. And I explained to him, I said, you know, I think Dina is the first zoning administrator that I can remember that's made it through three years. <laughs> we've, we've never had, had this, uh, at least in the, in the past 15 years or so. Maybe there's some longer ago that I can't remember. But um, anyway, um, we, we forgot it. So uh, he did a little research, got back to me, and said, yeah, the Vermont statutes are pretty clear that uh, the person who's holding the office is in the office until, um, until the successor is appointed. And I guess the, the law contemplates that sometimes people forget things, and they, they don't want to set up a situation where there's been a void and all the work that has been done in months goes by the board, permits not being uh, legal and the like. So anyway, uh, that assuaged my concerns that we didn't have a zoning administrator. And then uh, I talked with him and said, do we have to go through the same process as when she was first appointed, which is the planning commission nominates the zoning administrator and then the select board appoints. So um, he said, yes, that's exactly the situation that you're in. You've got to go through that process again. And if the uh, planning commission chooses to nominate her, they should make the nomination retroactive to March 1st. And then if the select board uh, uh, decides to go ahead and make the reappointment, the reappointment that the select board makes should be back to March 1st. For those of you who are new to the board, um, this is a kind of a two-step process. The select board is the appointing authority. Um, however, they can't make an appointment on their own. It has to be after a nomination by the planning commission. So uh, I guess it's a kind of a safety valve, if you will, trying to take politics a little bit out of this process. Um, it's a little cumbersome, especially when Folks like us forget about it, but uh, that's where we are. So uh, the Planning Commission um, took a long time. It was on three or four agendas, five agendas. And for a variety of reasons, it got pushed off um, until their last meeting. Um, Steve, I think you have the, um, the uh, motion that the Planning Commission made. The Planning Commission did move to renominate her, uh, and Dina is here. If you have questions, Steve is here. Um, certainly, I'm here. Um, just to make sure, you know, full disclosure, there was a little bit of a, there were some concerns expressed and and issues that were raised with regard for to some of the, uh, you know, I don't want to say performance, but. Just Dina's uh, administration of the job, and you know uh, whether there were uh, shortcomings or where things might be improved. And um, I've addressed that with the planning commission, and uh, there'll be a little bit more reporting, not only to me from the zoning administrator, but also to the to the boards. The DRB and the planning commission, at least the DRB gets. Um, they get reports now. Does the Planning Commission already planning get them? Gets the and uh, yeah. Dean and I have talked. And uh, while the Planning Commission's motion included a progress re report, will be made to the plan to the Planning Com Planning Commission and Select Board uh, by the end of October 2020. Um, I think what Dina has suggested, and I think it's a good idea, is that she will include the Select Board in the distribution list once she does her monthly report. So if there's any issues that come up, I know zoning sometimes can be a lightning rod issue. And I know all of you have probably been talked to by some people because, you know, it's, it's the only position in town where 
somebody is making a decision about what you can or can't do with your property, and people uh, take that seriously, and it ruffles feathers from time to time. So anyway, with that, I'll stop and recommend that you accept the Planning Commission's motion uh, that they have uh, nominated her for reappointment and that we would appoint her for a term beginning March 1st, 2019. And it is still a three-year term retroactive to that date. And the lawyer recommended that's how this be handled. He said, even though uh, nothing that Dina has done um, is thrown out because she wasn't appointed. Uh, and he said that's really in case she doesn't get reappointed. So the, the nomination should go back to March. <coughs> I just want to speak in behalf of Dina. I was on the um, DRB for a good portion of her tenure. She was very professional, uh, very thorough. Uh, she has a great knowledge of the law, and sometimes that the committee may have disagreed. Uh, I think she would explain things very well and why we're doing things. So I would highly recommend her continuation. Would you like to come up and speak at all, Dina, or are you happy where you're sitting? I'm happy where I'm sitting. Okay. Any other comments? I, I, I do, yeah, sure, hang on just a second. I do know that uh, not knowing the, the uh, broad scope of work that you have to handle many, many evenings after leaving meetings and whatnot, um, I've seen you still at your desk here. So I know that you're not goofing off. Um, I'm sure you're probably overwhelmed at times with the amount of details that is involved in your your type of work. Uh, and to be here for the entire three-year term <laughs> when past years other people haven't made it says does say something uh, for you. So uh, I'm glad to have your board. Yeah, Elmi, come up to the board, uh, mic there, please. I haven't worked with Dina professionally. Um, our, our roles don't overlap much, but I kind of wanted to, I guess, echo what Chris said, is that um, I'm sometimes here early-ish and sometimes here late-ish, and, and Dina is the person who's here so many hours and just putting in, seems like, you know, 110% to her job. So I, I mentioned that to her in the parking lot the other day, like, I see you here all the time. You're always the first car here, the last car to leave. So just wanted to say that. Good. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll just make one. I, I, I've heard some issues over the last couple of years, and I think a lot of it has to do with the different people that have held this role and, what, and how hard they held people to the, the rules that are written into the zoning. So I think. Um, some people are surprised when they're told no, or I think, you know, some of the things that I, th I think maybe we've already learned from is uh, verbal versus written answers on yes or no, I can do things, I think, came up that I've heard about that I think, you know, moving forward, we need to make sure that people aren't told one thing and then find out later that they can't or cannot do something. Um, and then the other thing I think that, I think Waterbury is doing a good job of that I just want to make sure that, and I think it's Steve, you, you have the same challenge too, is how do we hold people to the rules but make sure that you know we try to help people accomplish the goals that they set out maybe that has to be a slightly modified goal but um i you know I, I feel like years ago we had a little bit of an issue of of people being told no when they wanted to try something that maybe was just a little bit unique or i, I think that the changing business landscape especially in waterbury i think it's just going to continue to have people try to be creative and, and try to come up with different ways to, to do business in, in Waterbury. And I hope that we try to review what is actually being requested and then hopefully you know, work and see if there's repetitive requests. And, and maybe we have to look at changing some of those rules um, to make it a little bit more um, favorable to some things that are probably reasonable requests. But I think just that would be my one comment is just making sure that 
when we tell somebody no, try to work with them on a solution that still gets them to their ultimate goal, I think is something that's important. Um, and I think a lot of the people that have given me feedback, that's all they really needed. But when they just get a no, maybe they feel like they're just trying to do right by their business. And you know, there's a rule that says they can't do whatever they were trying to do. So I, I don't know, I guess that's my one comment, but thank you for sticking at it. And I know it's not easy, so. All right, if everybody's satisfied, um, somebody would like to make a motion to accept, accept the recommendation of the Planning Commission to nominate Dina for uh, the next three-year position, retroactive of March 1st, 2019, and will be a three-year term to March 1st, 2022. Somebody would like to make that motion. I'd make a motion to uh, reappoint Dina to, as the zoning administrator for a second um, three-year term. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, all those who wish to approve say aye. 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 Welcome back, board. <laughs> Three more years. Yeah. Okay. You can make it an early night and go home. Library <laughs> 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 well, Director's Quarterly Report. Tell me. Oh, there's no microphone over there. That works. I don't think I'll work. Oh, okay. That's a hot seat. You can see over it. Save you from standing. Good evening, everybody. I'm Almy Landauer, Library Director, for those of you watching later. So um, I am going to give you a brief report about the library's activities in the third quarter, July through September this year. And then I have a couple of um, handouts for you. Thank you for giving me time on, on the agenda. I appreciate it. Um, starting with some highlights. So the library staff was thrilled to have the opportunity to attend a national conference this fall that was held in Vermont for the first time. It was the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Um, they, they move it to a different state each, each year. And uh, as you can tell by the name, it was extremely pertinent and applicable to Vermont as a whole and to library in particular. Um, because oftentimes our, our national conferences for libraries, as you can imagine, have lots of information for big libraries, for library systems that don't necessarily uh, scale down to us as, in a helpful manner. So, so this was really wonderful and we, um, we had, it was a three and a half day conference. I attended the whole thing and um, See, I think two of the other staff, the full-time staff attended the entire conference and then some of our part-time staff uh, attended um, parts of it. Um, and we've been, we've been sharing what we've learned amongst ourselves and implementing some of those ideas. So that was really great. Um, one new thing that I worked on during that third quarter was I created a new page on our website called Resources. And it's a collection of links that are organized into a wide variety of issues for uh, people to uh, find the resources that they need, uh, both in our community and in Vermont. And there's some regional or national uh, resources as well, but I tried to really focus on uh, local and state ones. Um, so a wide variety of issues starting from news and education, mental health resources, uh, job hunting type resources, consumer resources, local history, links to arts and outdoor opportunities in Waterbury and the area, uh, government and, vet and veteran services as well. Um, let's see, we had Bill McSallis. I don't know if any of you have met him. He just became this summer the um, security, in charge of security for all state buildings. Prior to that, he was uh, FBI and Homeland Security person. And he, uh, his wife works at the Williston Library, so he's over the past several years become interested in helping libraries uh, get trained and address security type of issues. 
Um, so I had the pleasure of, uh, of attending a workshop of his at a Vermont Library Association conference several years ago, and I thought he provided some really um, important training. So we brought him here, and um, all of the staff and one of our subs attended a two-hour training with him where we looked at our particular building um, the li in the library, um, and he gave us a lot of um, information about how to respond to active threats, um, what to do in different types of scenarios, um, and he helped us, um, he, he, ha he gave me information that helped me update uh, and create some new um, standard operating procedures for situations that either could turn into something threatening or are threatening. Um, and I think um, everybody who works in the library feels uh, really good about uh, having those in place. Um, and that, that was in August. Another highlight for the, the three-month period was that we had some new bookshelves installed that were paid for by the capital campaign and built by BCI, which is the Vermont Correctional Industries, who built most of the rest of the furnishings when this building in the library, when the building was built, and they do a great job. Um, these were bookshelves that these are bookshelves that our new book sale is on. So if you go into the library and go up the stairs uh, in the front of the library, in the landing at the top, um, you'll see them there. And they look really great, and they match all the other shelving in the library, which is nice. Um, and we've, the, the friends have been, um, we have a couple volunteers that run the book sale, and the friends have been um, uh, gleaning about, um, $50 a month from the book sale. And these are all books that are donated to the library. They're most, occasionally put a few weeded books in there from our collection, but it's mostly donations. So it's been, it's been good. Um, so I think I've mentioned before that I'm working on doing outreach and integrating the library more into the community. And some of the activities that I've worked on in the third quarter include, um, I helped run the Sunzilla contest down at Rusty Parker uh, in September, and that was a really fun community event. I don't know if any of you have gone to it, but it was a lot of fun. Um, we've partnered with the Food Shelf to have a permanent collection box in the uh, library's foyer, uh, so people can uh, drop off food uh, there for the Food Shelf. Uh, and I think people appreciate it because of the library's hours, and you know, we're open a lot, so it makes it easy to combine that with other errands. Um, I also reached out to the Waterbury Center Church, and we had a donation box for their winter clothing drive in the library. Um, and the same with the uh, Harwood Union Refugee Outreach Club. Um, we offered to have a collection box for their fall clothing drive in the library as well, and I think actually that's still going on, so. Uh, we also, I did do a light weed of fiction um, books this fall, or started to, and uh, some of those books we ended up donating to the food shelf. They have a small uh, collection of books that people can grab when they come for their food. Um, so we gave some to them, and then we also gave some to a group home in Waterbury that is just starting to have um, their own sort of small lending library, and they kind of needed a seed collection, so we were able to provide them with some weeded books. Uh, something that was a little different and interesting, we hosted some students and staff from an independent school called Mountain River School in Morrisville. Um, they are in a new location, in a new building, and are starting up their own school library and they had a lot of questions about how to set up and run a library so they came and visited us and the students asked some really great questions and we gave them a tour of the library and gave them a little tiny bit of information about library science and how they might um, organize their library so that was that was really interesting um, and then this month is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month is October, and we partnered with the Central Vermont Women's Giving Circle to have a display of books and brochures and other resources and information upstairs in our, our display area. So I'd like to highlight a couple of programs. Um, first, uh, we had a really nice email message from a patron 
after he received our November newsletter, we send out, Judy is our program facilitator, and she sends out a monthly newsletter that lists all our programs for the upcoming month. And he wrote us back and he said, <clears throat> Wow, go Waterbury Library. This is an amazing email full of so many great events and thoughtful details. We are lucky to live in a town with a vibrant library led by a nice team in a clean building with amazing views and a great selection. Thanks so much for all you do. It's always nice to get a little pat on the back from the people we serve, so I wanted to share that. Uh, we have a number of ongoing programs that happen either monthly or weekly uh, in the library. Uh, for adults um, and children, including uh, Food for Thought book group, uh, story times twice a week, after school programs once or twice a week, depending on the week. And then new in the third quarter, uh, Judy added uh, chair yoga, which happens weekly. This is a, a program that started in the senior center, and then they needed to find a new location this summer because um, the camp, summer camps were using the senior center for their food programs. So they asked us uh, if they could use the cell room in the library, and they ended up liking it so much that they wanted to stay. So we have accommodated them, and they've continued to come here. Uh, we also started a weekly uh, bri beginner's bridge lesson, which has been very popular, and they seem to be having an awful lot of fun in there. Um, and a monthly tabletop board game um, that also meets in the cell room on a Saturday. And all three of those, the Chair Yoga, the Beginner's Bridge, and the Tabletop Board Games are led by volunteers from the community, which is nice. And then some of the single events that we had uh, during this last quarter included, uh, we had a Tick Smart um, program. It was actually two programs, one for kids where they played some games and learned how to ID ticks, and then one for um, adults that was more geared towards uh, Lyme disease and identification and, and uh, prevention. And the Friends uh, kicked in some funding for tick removers for everyone who attended the programs and also that we, we've had them at the front desk for giveaway and they look like this. They're a little plastic spoon kind that has a little tip at the end. You can use that to remove a tip, tick and it comes with a little informational card. So if you would like one, you can come into the library and get one. <coughs> Uh, kids also participated in programs like making air gliders and um, live animals from the Southern Vermont History uh, Center came up um, and brought some live animals, which is always a big hit. They made Al Alka-Seltzer rockets, which they um, shot off from the picnic table out back. Uh, that was a big hit. They made duct tape crafts, duct tape crafts. Uh, they had a music program, a book group this summer for kids. A puppet show that's put on, I guess it's an annual sort of tradition, well, one family in town puts it on every year. Uh, they did origami, um, and we also did our own version of a breakout room, which was fun. Uh, in the adult arena, about 60 people came to a music program and talk about Aaron Copeland's America with Michael Arnowit, and that was a, a Vermont Humanities Council program. We also had another packed house uh, at an author talk, Megan Price, um, who shared her hilarious stories from behind the scenes with Vermont and Maine wildlife rangers, and she's written a whole series of these books. I brought one to show you because I thought some of you might be interested in reading it. Uh, one of them, this is, what number is this? This is volume two. I think it was the only one that was in when I went looking. They're very popular. Um, and she just has all these stories of mishaps and people running afoul, pun intended. Um, with, uh, with the Rangers, so it's a fun book. And she, I wasn't there, but I'm told her talk was, had people in stitches, so that was really fun. Our technology librarian, Delia, um, met with 44 different community members in her one-on-one -on -one tech sessions over the course of that, that uh, the third, third uh, quarter. And her, she also runs a monthly uh, class, technology class, here at the library, and her topics this time were citizen science, how to video chat, and maxing out your library card, which was all about the resources that taxpayers can access with their library cards, online resources mostly. And then finally, I would like to just end with a fun story, and then any questions that you have. So um, in July, I received an envelope in the mail. I opened it up. 
and it was a check for $500 made out to the library from somebody named Susan C. Shell. And that was a fun envelope to open, but we didn't know who she was. Um, even Jill, who seems to know everybody, didn't know who she was, except she was a little suspicious because of the C. She thought maybe it was somebody who she knew, but had you know, changed her, got married and changed her name. Um, so we later learned that the C stood for Campbell. And I was able to uh, contact the financial agent of the account that this came from and get the name of the account manager and f find out a little bit more about this. What, what was this all about? So he told me that she was Susan Campbell at the time, and she lived in Totten Library in the 1960s. She's now in her 80s, and every year she is selecting various charities to give her money to. Like, apparently she has no family left. And this year, she decided to give money to each town that she had ever lived in during the course of her life. And so in Waterbury, she decided to donate money to the library. And that's why this nice check came in the mail. But no strings attached. So um, our plan at this point is um, to help, help us complete a project that has been in the works for a while and kind of sitting on the back shelf for lack of funding, which is theme bags. And what that means is um, it's a bag or a backpack with uh, a number of different items in it, like um, some books, a game, maybe, um, maybe some flashcards or different I educational items um, that all revolve around a theme like frogs or letters and numbers or human body or different things like that. Um, and it co also comes with some instructional materials. And families can check these out in the library. Um, child care centers can check them out at the library. So uh, before I got here, uh, Mary and Michelle had purchased the bags that they're going to go in, but they didn't have the funds yet for the contents. So we are thinking that this $500 will go most of the way to filling these bags and having them available to people to check out. So. Were you able to send her a thank you now? Oh, uh, yes. I was able to get her address and sent her a thank you note. And she just sent the check and didn't tell you anything about right. the purpose? Just, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good detective yeah. work. Right. <laughs> Is she still living in Waterbury, or is she not? No, um, it was a little hard to tell. Um, the return address was like Idaho or something, and then but then the financial agent was California, so I think she's living in California. I'd be curious to know when she lived here. In, in the 60s. In the 60s. How yeah. long, any idea how, for how long? It didn't sound like too, too long, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure exactly. A question going back into... Uh, I can't remember the name of the gentleman who you said, uh, the FBI guy who... Oh, Bill McSalis. Right. Um, did he say anything about the library or anything about, in this building, vulnerabilities that we may have? Yeah, he pointed out a few things. Um, you know, he, he's, go, he's gone into all different kinds of buildings. And, right. you know, I mean, a, a, lot, a public library is meant to be an open space, open to the public, and so right. that inherently has some issues that other types of buildings might not have. It's very open. Um, there's, you know, he made a couple of small recommendations like uh, putting, a, putting a blind on the office doors so that if we're in there hiding, uh, uh, we can, you know, close, close those kinds of small things like that. Um, but we actually, I was, I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised, I guess, if you can use the word pleasant in such a situation. Um, that you know, he was able to really give us some good tips about um, where to go and what to do and how to hide and how to get out of the building. We do have a lot of exits, which is good. Right. Um, so, so it was it was very helpful in a practical way. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Just don't hide behind the chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it too much TV. I was going to ask you: um, Is it starting to get a little crowded in the library? As far as people or, or materials? <laughs> well, everything that you seem to be oh. bringing into the library with all the programs and all the other items that, uh, mm -hmm. it sounds like it might start to get a little bit crowded here before too long. Are you suggesting that we put an addition on the library? <laughs> no, no, I'll be strung up for sure. <laughs> 
Well, um, we, we definitely, um, we, we sometimes run out of space. The cell room is booked. The two study rooms are very heavily used. Um, so sometimes that does come up. Um, and we're open three nights a week, which is nice. Um, but those nights are pretty packed with different, you know, different things. Um, both library programs and other people wanting to use our space. So the, from what I understand, a typical rep, reputation of a library is you're supposed to be able to go in there and sit down and literally hear a pin drop. It doesn't sound like uh, perhaps this library is quite so... Uh, yeah, that model has kind of changed over the years yeah. uh, in general, not just in our library. They're not necessarily quiet spaces. Um, and, you know, occasionally there's a little grumbling about that, but we do have the two study rooms and we try to accommodate you know some quiet spaces it's a pretty open as you know design so that doesn't really help with the noise right. but um you know the cell room does have doors that can close so after school programs for example are in the cell room the doors are closed um so yeah we make it work good i think it works generally. yeah yeah how's your telescope doing oh my gosh it's out all the time yeah yeah so we we it, it was going out pretty regularly and then we had this shout out in front porch forum from a patron who used it and was like oh my god did you library has a telescope this is great and then we got like all these you know holds on it people five or six people that said put my name down for that so and then since then it's 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 out more than it's in like when it's on the front desk we're like oh yeah we have a telescope and then it leaves the next day so how long did one person keep it out? It's a week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we used it for a program last month. Um, the Vermont Astronomical Society came up. Some of their members brought their own telescopes and took our telescope and went out to the fields and the lights were off and did a, did a program, you know, just pointing their telescopes and telling people what they were looking at. And I think almost 60 people showed up for that, all different ages, you know, parents bringing their kids and older folks and so that was that was fun and we hope to do that again during Winterfest as well well it sounds like you're having a lot of good fun and uh, yeah. keep it up thank you I think probably I'm, I'm very important. impressed at the educational component to all that uh, and the diversity of topics but um, it's it's I'm just very impressed thank you I will good pass job. it on to the staff yeah I as well thank you uh, so I wanted to share with you, um, this is similar, you might remember I gave you this last time um, for, the, uh, for the, that quarter. These are just some really basic statistics about what's happening at the library. Door count, how many materials have been borrowed, how many public computer uses, new patrons, those kinds of things. And then this is um, uh, a new handout that we have for, for our pa new patrons that come in and old patrons if they need some information. That, kind of puts all the information about what's available at the library in one place. It's rather long, um, but I wanted each of you to have one of those. And our, our new uh, employee, Maggie, um, was, was really the one who did the most lion's share of work on that, so I want to give her a shout out. Oops, thank you. statistics compared to, did you have this data for last year, 2018? Um, I probably have most of it, but I wasn't here for the whole year. So my plan is at the end of this year, or maybe early next year, by the time I get it all together, um, I'll give you some comparisons. Great. How do folks like myself, you know, I've been in the library, but I don't really take out materials. How do you account for people? I know you have the door count, but you know. Yeah. But other than that, how do you know people like myself who are using the library? Well, it's 
it's, it's not something we count, like we don't really have a category for that other than the door count. We have right. a category for the door count. We have computer users. Right. Uh, we have people who, we know how many people come to programs. Right. Um, and that's, that's pretty much what we count. We, we, do, um, we do keep track of reference questions too. So if somebody, uh, I actually have, I haven't been doing it um, this year. I just realized that it's something we're supposed to report and I was like, oh, we haven't been doing that. So I'm gonna start, um, but I think Mary did it before me. Um, reference questions meaning anybody who is not like where's the bathroom or something like that but you know anybody who's using the library staff as a resource to find out something even if it's a visitor to library coming in and saying uh, like i had somebody recently saying that, you know stopped here because they couldn't find the welcome center at the train station so they stop at the library and they say where is the welcome center so we tell them yeah. Those kinds of things. And then, of course, the traditional library questions about books and authors and those kinds of things. Well, that's the most important thing to me is some of the information that the librarians do, do provide mm -hmm. is, you know, guide you to where things are in the library. Even though I may not be taking out things, I'm usually using things there. Yeah. You know, because otherwise, that? you know, a lot of times, you know, you just go home and you, you go on your computer and, mm -hmm. you know. Well, there's, you know, there's a saying in the business, the librarians are the original Google. Yes. I have a cousin who's a librarian are in they? Chicago. Yes, okay. he, he, he's a strong believer in how, how important libraries are in our society. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully he's shared some of that with you. Yes. Okay. Can you tell me the uh, person who does the um, computer information sessions? Um, I, I have a, a tablet that seems to be a mystery to me, mm -hmm. um, and it's getting, it's getting more mysterious all the time. Um, do you have to sign up for a one-on-one? -on -one yes, she takes appointments, and she usually, she's here three days a week, okay. and she usually has two appointments each of those days available. So you can either stop by the front desk or give us a call. Um, and okay. see what's available. Thank you. Yeah, and she'd be happy she, to help you with that. She's here in the evenings at all? Yeah, she's here on Tuesday evenings. That's when she usually holds her classes, but the other three Tuesdays where she's not doing the class, she has some appointments available after six. She can help unlock the mystery of this challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Her name is Delia, if you okay, need to ask great. for her. Yeah. And all of our, all of our emails are our first name, at waterburypubliclibrary.com. So okay. you can email her, Delia, at waterburypubliclibrary.com. She'll get back to you. Just spell out Waterbury Public Library. Yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. You're good to tell me. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate your time. Bill, the manager. So the first uh, thing I'm going to ask you to do is uh, reconsider <coughs> your uh, approval of the agenda, because I just realized while I was sitting here that there's nothing on here about health insurance rates, and I didn't <laughs> ask you at the top to add it. I, I assumed it was on there, and it was a bad assumption. So we do need to talk about health insurance. We can put that as last on the manager's item. Can I just amend my motion to include that? Good. Is there, well, do we need a second? And yeah, I, yeah. Yes. I'll okay. second. All right. All those in favor of the change, say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, Steve is here for a couple of things. Uh, this contract for wayfinding kiosks and then uh, the one about the dashboard preparedness, Emerald dashboard preparedness. So I can go ahead, Steve. Okay, good. So we're actually just going to do one. Um, we um, working with uh, Herman on the forestry, and um, quite honestly, there's an um, issue that Tom Sweet was uncomfortable with with the conflict of interest since Dan Sweet is a municipal employee. And I thought about this, but uh, and I discussed it with we, Bill. We, we have a grant. And yeah, the grant it's federal money. It's federal money, and, and it requires us to have a conflict of interest policy, which we have. <clears throat> and the policy says that uh, you can't 
have a contract with somebody if they or a family member is an employee of the town and uh, Dan Sweet is our assessor and uh, he is a, uh, one of the principals of uh, Hunger Mountain Forestry. So um, uh, Tom has, we just learned this today, um, thought that we would be able to get the contract um, approved tonight. <clears throat> you might want to just tell them what it is, and then right. Tom is going to be recommending a yeah. floor. Yeah, it's all amicable. I've talked to both Tom and Dan about it. They're familiar with the project. This is the Emerald Ash Borer uh, Preparedness and Management Plan. We've done a um, ash roadside ash inventory, working with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and um, this was done on uh, tablets with the Tree Committee and uh, Jane was involved, and um, we got uh, virtually all of the uh, wooded areas that um, have a fair amount of ash inventory, literally hundreds, we're probably in the five or 600 uh, ash tree um, count at this point. So that's being mapped, and then um, we'll be coming back to you with, um, it's, there's a $2,000 grant which will pay for the, um, preparedness and management plan. And I learned about something very interesting. There's research done that white ash, which is uh, the predominant ash tree in Waterbury and uh, quite honestly in most of uh, Vermont, has shown some resistance to emerald ash borers. This is a fairly new study, but we're, this will be worked into our plan. So um, we'll be coming back to you once we have uh, another consultant um, have a draft contract to uh, hire them. The other project is our wayfinding signage, which is in conjunction with the Main Street reconstruction project. You've got um, a draft contract in your packet, and um, we made sure to include that, and uh, it's with Landworks. Uh, Landworks is a landscape architecture and planning firm in Middlebury. Uh, they're the ones that designed the original wayfinding system, and I believe we um, briefed you about this about two years ago when uh, the Main Street plans were being finalized. On the back side is um, the graphic for uh, there are five kiosks that are going to be placed. Um, in the extent of um, near the roundabout and post office all the way down to Demerit Place. And um, the front side is going to be wayfinding with mapping. Uh, the rear side of uh, each, well, actually of four of the kiosks, uh, is interpretive information. The one that shows on this graphic that uh, where the sign says information is about the history of uh, the, the, mainly the Stowe, first block in Stowe Street. So we're going to be doing um, four total. We have a committee that's working on the content. And then uh, we would like to hire Landworks to do the graphic work. And then because they did the design work, uh, we've talked to VTrans with their um, design engineer through Ken Uphall. And uh, uh, they are allowing us to do an inspection of the, um, the final product, if you will, the actual kiosks, they're going to be fabricated this winter. And um, so we think it's important to have the designer actually inspect those. This is commonplace. Make sure before they're installed that they meet all the specifications, that the craftsmanship is good, and that the graphics represents what's designed in the bid package. In other words, this is all in the bid package for the Main Street reconstruction project and uh, is being bid, uh, or was bid, and um, Wooden Wood Signs uh, out of uh, Warren is going to be the, uh, the uh, subcontractor that will do the work. They did our municipal sign out front. So um, the contract is pretty straightforward. It's going to occur in two phases. Uh, one will be this fall, which will be the design phase. Uh, and again, our, um, our subcommittee will be working with with Landworks to do that. It's Bart Farr and Karen Nevin and myself. Um, and then the second phase will be later on in the winter or early spring, which will be the inspection of the uh, wayfinding signage. 
Um, there will also be paddle signs, the tip, I call them paddle signs, that give, give you directions to different parts of the um, downtown and the Main Street area. So the total contract is uh, $4,960. And um, so what we're asking for tonight <clears throat> is that you would authorize Bill to sign the contract on um, behalf of the town, and uh, then we'll, we'll be able to move forward with the project. So are there any questions or clarifications that you need? Steve, is Landworks the same company that did the byway? Um, they did the byway okay. quarter management plan. I think you were involved with the Conservation right. Commission at the time. Uh, they also did the consultant work for our Ridgeline Hillside Steep Slope Overlay yeah. yep, that back in, too, too. Um, I think, around 2000. Boy, you're reaching way back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're an excellent firm. They do a lot of great visual work, graphic work, visual analysis. And um, so it'll, it'll be good to have them uh, be consistent and have them do this design work as well. Thanks. Are these kiosks lit up as well? They're actually not going to be lit. There's a lot of ambient light with street lamps in the areas where all of these uh, will be. They're going to be in uh, the road right of way or uh, the adjacent town property, and um, there will be street lights, either the period lights or um, existing LED street lights in the area. I can say I didn't see any lights on the drone. We, we so. considered that and um, <clears throat> considered solar light, uh, a panel with solar lights for the one that will be down by the roundabout, but ultimately decided that it really wasn't necessary. It was just more technology and equipment that we would have to maintain, and mm -hmm. it wasn't necessary. Mm -hmm. And there's three of them? Yep. There are actually five yeah. total. Um, very quickly, at the roundabout, uh, Bidwell Lane and Stowe Street, uh, in front of the former TD Bank parking lot. There'll be one in the front of Rusty Parker Park, right um, by the sidewalk there near the, the mailbox. And Demerit Place, out in front of the former uh, Freedom Chevrolet. And the, and the money to, to pay this contract comes from where? This is the Main Street Reconstruction Project. So we have non-participating non um, parts of the project that are funded uh, with town funds. Okay. So the cost is, as described here, there are any additional costs? Right. The, the, all the rest of the cost of uh, fabricating Advocating. and installation is part of the Main Street Reconstruction project package. Budget. Okay, right. so we're paying for the design. Just, the design. just finishing the, the design. And the installation will be part of the, right. will be a participating item. That's my understanding. Well, we have a downtown yes. transportation fund grant, okay. which um, has matching funds. So that's going to pay for you the approved, signage. Uh, right. It's been about two, at least two years. Mm -hmm. So it's actually being funded through the downtown transportation okay. fund grant. It's an ancillary grant to the Main Street Correct. project. Some of which, you know, we have funding for the business um, work that Revitalizing Water is doing and, and things. So it's it's not the two percent, you know. The it's a different range. It's, it's part of, but we did get some grant funds to help with the non-participating costs, and, and this is one of them. So. Right, and a lot of that downtown transportation fund grant is being matched by the the V Trans funding. So um, this is. Uh, I think it will be a, a good deal in that right. sense. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? All right, seeing none, would somebody like to make a motion then to authorize uh, the acceptance of a contract between the town of Waterbury and Landworks of Middlebury for the uh, Construction and design of the uh, kiosks, five kiosks. For well, I think it's not the construction, it's just the, pro just the design. professional the design. And, yeah. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further comments? All those in favor say aye then. Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, thanks. So I have the original, do you want to decide it now or tomorrow? Um, this one is dated today. Um, 
as opposed to November 1, and I took draft on it. That's it. Yeah, just the one. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Okay, that cuts through two of your items there, Bill, I guess, huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah letters, letter C will go quickly. Um, I put it on here just for process reasons. Uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with Revitalizing Waterbury. And uh, in that MOU, which I did not print out just to save a piece of paper or seven, uh, the MOU uh, requires us to inform revitalizing water rate in the fall before the new year starts if we're considering not funding them in the future. Uh, they have not put their funding uh, request together yet. Uh, that will be probably in December. Um, but as the MOU requires us to uh, let them know if we're not going to fund them, I just wanted to get it on the agenda, give you the opportunity to say that, and then tell you that my recommendation is that we, we do need to fund them. Uh, they are an integral part of the Main Street Reconstruction Project. I just explained to you one of the grants that we have uh, where they're providing uh, you know, business assistance services and other um, functions during the revival, during that project. So uh, I don't expect that their funding request is going to be significantly different than it has been in the past. It's, uh, if I remember correctly, it's around seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars for their what they call a traditional budget, and then uh, around fifty-four thousand dollars for the economic development director. Um, and I think that in particular with the Main Street project going on and the fact that we are relying on them to provide um, public assistance during that, that this is not the year to even think about cutting that out. So if you're not going to not fund them, then we can move on to the next item. A double negative. Right. <laughs> Is there out any outcries for uh, not funding them? No, I'll, I'll echo Bill. I think it's going to be really important, um, especially next year when they get into the core of the downtown. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, thanks. Yes, we can move on. Yep. Um, did we miss B? Or did no, I? No, that was the Google dashboard. That was a conflict, about conflict, about conflict with the uh, 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 suite. Sorry about that. He took it. He took it first. So. Yep. Um, anyway, at your places, you have uh, the August and September reports from the uh, state police contract, and you also have uh, it says first quarter report. Um, it's the first quarter of the state's budget, but it's really our third quarter. So. The period July through September is uh, included there as a, as a whole. I won't spend too much time on it. All the bar charts look very similar. I mean, the pie charts look very similar to uh, each other and similar to what they've looked like in the past. Um, I continue, you know, I, I don't get any uh, real feedback one way or the other. Uh, you know, the public isn't calling me every week or even every month saying, what about this, what about that, what are the police doing? Uh, my sense is that from what I see and from what we're uh, seeing on this report, that we're getting uh, what we anticipated from the, the service. Uh, I, I do see the uh, officers around. Uh, both here in the village and up in Waterbury Center. Um, I did reach out uh, to um, Major Jonas, Henry Jonas, 
is the uh, major of the state police. She is one of the folks who oversees this contract. Um, is the highest direct ranking person that I have access to with regard to this contract. Um, and, and simply asked whether the state was considering anything but renewing the contract if we wanted to. Now just to remind you, the contract runs through June 30th. Uh, so uh, at the very least, we have to uh, budget for six months worth in 2020. Um, she responded to me and said that from their perspective, it's going very well, um, but she would not be able to get uh, to provide me with a definitive answer about whether they would be willing to re-up until um, late in December, probably. Uh, and clearly, you know, they, as the Vermont State Police, have to put their own needs first. And she talked about, you know, the number of vacancies they have uh, in the entire system and what the legis what they're going to be asking the legislature for, and um, you know whether or not they can continue this contract and still meet their statewide mission. But um, she said that from their perspective, it was going well and all things being equal, uh, the, the state police uh, view it as a positive and, and she doesn't see why they wouldn't be interested in moving forward if that was our choice. But they can't say that for certain yet. So. When I know more, you'll know more, but that's, that's where it is right now. Well, we would still be in the midst of uh, budget discussions there at that yeah, point. Yeah, we'll, so we'll have not even really started. I mean, we'll be starting our budget maybe the second meeting in December. When we'll get into some of it, and then in January in earnest. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to wait until the very end to ask. I thought getting some information. Uh, a little bit earlier, especially if, if the word was no. So right now the word is a, you know, is a blinking yellow light uh, favoring <laughs> toward green, I would say, but that can change. Very and, 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 and I didn't tell her that, that the select board had decided to go forward with it. I simply asked, if we want to, will you be willing to? So I didn't commit us either because uh, you know, that's for, for you folks to decide right. as we put the budget together for next year. Right. Very antidotally, um, from what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing around town, I don't hear of any real complaints. I, I think we had more complaints when we had our own police department, to be quite honest. And I think what's it's the relationship with the Vermont State Police is working well. Uh, you know, I keep on saying I need to attend one of their, you know, little monthly meetings. It always seems to come on a bad day. And But I think the troopers, you know, I've spoken to them at various town events, and they seem to be very happy. I think most of the town is very happy with the service we're getting. Probably with the little exception of the people on Gupta Road with uh, speeding. So, speaking of up the road speeding, do you want to yeah, we have a discussion about your speed bump there, Jane? Or do we want to go to health insurance first? Oh, well, let's. Uh, I think the health insurance. Maybe we should jump through this speed bump thing there first. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you know, I realize that I just, when I come home from work, I don't generally drive down um, Guptill Road. I go on a Route 100 and turn on my street. And then my husband said, have you driven across that speed bump? <laughs> so I had to go check it out. And um, I know there's been some comments on Front Porch Forum, which I haven't really been paying, as, reading as much as I usually do, but I've seen a few. Um, I, I have some experience in, from my job and years past on traffic calming. So, um, um, and I did review some sources of information, which is easy to do online now. And 
What's there now is a speed bump, and I, I think that they're good for a temporary measure or because um, you can purchase them and put them out there, made out of rubber. Um, but I think it's more appropriate to have a, a speed table. Or it's, it's actually three devices. There's a speed hump, which is very small, and it forces you to slow down you can't really even go over that thing at 10 miles an hour, barely. It's more like eight miles an hour. And the, the data that's online says from two to two to 10 miles an hour. Um, and it, the speed bump is so small, you, it, it, um, it's very abrupt and it, it jars you in your car, as well as if you had something you know, in your car, you might, might shake it up. And it's not recommended for um, emergency vehicles because of that. And it's not really recommended for, for streets. It's recommended more for a parking lot or private, private driveways or something. Whereas uh, um, the speed hump, so we got three different things. The speed hump is larger than the speed bump. It's more it's flatter. And you can go over it. Um, a little faster, I think from 10 to 15 miles an hour, and it's more of a rocking motion. Um, it also could be purchased and there can be made out of rubber if you, rather than a permanent asphalt one. Um, and they are generally used in a series on a roadway, a local roadway, um, but often with curbs. We don't have any curbs. So then we, the third device that I think might be more appropriate, which would require, I think, I don't know if you can purchase them, or you have to build that out of asphalt. And you have to be very careful with the, the ge geometry of these things so they work properly is a speed table, which is uh, wider and flatter. It's flat at the top, and then it has a gradual um, slope on either side. And that's recommended also for local roads. Um, flat in the middle, local and collector road. And the, it's not for 85th percentile at 45 miles per hour or more. And that's not what we have. The posted speed is typically 30 miles per hour or less. So that seems like a more appropriate place for a speed table. Um, three to four inch height. I, I don't disagree with anything that you're saying, Jane. Uh, so, after the meeting we had when uh, all of the folks were here from Guttel Road uh, and told us that you know we didn't listen to them and that we didn't hear them, um, you know uh, we heard them and listened to them this time. Now we happen to have a portable speed bump that we were able to uh, that you know we had in our possession and. Um, you know, we're, we were not able to get the uh, state to authorize the blinking sign, and it's not going to happen until next year. Um, so to do something, uh, I told the Woodruff to get that speed bump up there. And uh, yeah, I've driven over it, and I, I don't think any of them are ideal for Guppel Road. I think that that road, um, where it is now, it's in the 30 mile an hour zone. Um, I think it might even be 25 there. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I'm not sure that a uh, speed bump, hump, or table is really ideal for Guptal Road. That one will be coming out within the next couple of weeks. It's not something that we can plow over. So mm -hmm. it was meant to just get out there and to do what it's doing, is to get people to notice and slow down a little bit. We put signs up, uh, if people read the signs, they should know that there's one there. And uh, if they hit it going too fast, maybe they won't go so fast the next time. Um, we're still planning to go forward with the you know, uh, rural roads program that we talked about uh, next spring. Uh, I don't believe there is a speed uh, table involved in that. We have speed tables on Randall Street right now, and we have, I believe, their tables on Butler Street as well. Um, but as I said, I, I don't really 
believe Governor Road is an ideal spot for any of those three items, but just to try to get a... a well, I just have some concern about, you know, the fact that it's not recommended for a public road and it's not recommended for an emergency vehicle. Um, well, an emergency you can't vehicle is going to go over something. So if you want it out, we'll take it out. But uh, okay. we're trying to do something I to understand. assuage their yep. concerns. It's, it's not ideal and it's not meant to be permanent. And uh, it's going to be coming out uh, in a couple of weeks at the latest. And if you're concerned about it, we'll take it out this week. What have you received comments? No, not the rest. Or I, minus. I saw a couple of comments on front porch forum, and but no direct calls. Some people, no, nobody's called. Mm -hmm. Not me anyway. Yeah. I mean, I've gone over it a couple of times. I've seen the sign there. I slow right down to almost a dead stop, and. Uh, of course, I look at Bill Minter's house on one side, the post office on the other side, and my truck goes over the top of it, and I think to myself, I imagine some of them bigger trucks make some awful good noises going over the top of that thing, so I'm wondering if, uh, if there's uh, any distaste for the banging that goes on when people hit it. Uh, well, it seemed like if we had a speed hump in our, in our uh, repertoire, we don't. that might be more appropriate because well, we you could go a little time. faster. And okay. if, you, if you don't want it there, we'll take it out. We're almost at the end of the summer season, and like Bill said, it's got to come out of there in order for the roads to be plowed anyway. And maybe between now and next spring, we can uh, get our hands on something different or make a, make uh, uh, reservations to, to do something that. Do you know the cost of these signs um, that we're going to be getting through VTrans? I think we estimated the flash was like five thousand. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think it was a little more than that. Sixty-five hundred brings a bell in my head. Is there something that you could um, we could? Um, I know in the past sometimes these have been available to borrow from other communities, or are they you know mobile? Can we move them up from Stowe no, Street up there? No, they're not mobile. They're, they're permanent. Do we know to Jane? Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Healthcare. I don't want to talk about it. Because <laughs> I know what it means. I need money. More money out of our pockets. No. Out of employees' pockets, too. Yeah. More money for less service. in 2019 that were eligible for health insurance. Uh, 16 actually chose it. And the 16 uh, people who chose to go on the health insurance chose one of those plans that's highlighted in blue. And you can see there that um, the, the lowest increase is over on the left-hand side for the plans that our employees take, 8.33% for uh, somebody who takes the bronze um, blue rewards plan, high deductible plan, and that's 8.33%, that's a single plan. 
The highest percentage increase is at the top right on the, the second plan down. That gold, that word gold should be in blue. Um, we have a couple people that take the, uh, the standard plan, gold uh, family plan, and you can see that increase is 18.3%, which is a huge percentage increase. Um, the next column over to the right, where it shows 10.82%, uh, that is the uh, average uh, increase of all of these plans. So um, it all adds up to 562.78, and if you divide that by 52 plans, there's 13 different plans offered. Each of them has four different plans available, single, two-person, adult, and family. So um, the average increase that Blue Cross has uh, across all plans is 10.82%. And then down at the bottom, you can see there's another sum of numbers there, 210.13%. Uh, divide that by 52. Uh, not, not by 52, I'm sorry, by however many are there, 13. Um, and the, the plans that we take are 13.13% um, uh, 13 .13 increase. So, you know, looking at that, it's, it's hard to say, wow, this is a simple solution because um, unless we offer nothing, uh, you know, the, our costs are going to go up considerably. So in the uh, memo, I've given some history of, of where we came from, how we got where we are now, and what I think is a reasonable thing to consider. Um, the, in 2014, uh, when Health Connect came into being, the state's, um, the state's plan uh, that uh, implemented the Affordable Care Act, the town moved away from simply picking you know, two or three plans and telling employees, choose one of these three and uh, we'll pay this amount for it. We tried in 2014 to allow employees to choose any plan that was offered through the health exchange. Uh, there are only two companies that offer plans in the health exchange, Blue Cross and MVP. Um, that first year, the state had so much difficulty getting the uh, Health Connect uh, website and, and all of the uh, you know, stuff that goes on in the in the back computers to work correctly, we ended up having to scrap the, you can choose any plan that's offered to, you can choose any Blue Cross plan that's offered. So that's what we've been offering since 2014. Um, some things have gotten worse over time with uh, the Affordable Care Act. It depends maybe on your political persuasion, but the current presidential administration continues to take action to, to gut the plan. The, the individual mandate is gone now, which in my estimation, and I'm speaking for myself, um, encourages young, healthy people not to buy insurance because they'll take the risk. And what that leaves you with is older, less healthy people trying to buy insurance. And what happens is when only sick old people are buying insurance, costs go up, so premiums go up. Um, but uh, one thing that has gotten better is that both Blue Cross and MVP now have good viable plans. So if we can work it out, and it's, it's still an if, I don't think it will hurt for me to re make this recommendation now because it doesn't come to pass, uh, we'll just well often the Blue Cross plans, but I'm about 90% sure right now that we can offer, allow our employees to buy any plan on the exchange, MVP or Blue Cross. I've worked out that with MVP. Uh, they are willing to uh, allow us to offer one of their plans, and if any employee takes it, even if it's only one employee, they'll be willing to sell um, uh, sell a plan through 
the town of Waterbury and the Edward Farrar Utility District, even for 140. Um, I have not finalized everything with Blue Cross yet. Um, hopeful that they would uh, do the same thing and allow it. The reality is, is that Blue Cross has still got the heavyweight name behind it, and sometimes people, uh, especially people who don't like to think about their health insurance, decide, well, I, I want Blue Cross because I know my doctor takes it, I don't have to move a different network or whatever. <clears throat> but um, I would like the board to allow me to offer to employees either the Blue Cross plan or the MVP plans. I don't have the MVP plans shown here. Uh, the way our system works, it really doesn't matter that I'm showing those prices to you because the recommendation is as it has been since 2014, not that we buy a particular plan, but that we simply offer our employees a monthly allowance and let them buy the plan that works best for them. And if they buy a platinum plan uh, from either Blue Cross or MVP, frankly, they're going to probably have to pay something out of their own pocket for that premium. And if they buy a uh, you know bronze high deductible plan, uh, the premium is less than the allowance, and we allow them to use the remainder to put into an HSA or people who um, buy plans that aren't. HDHP compatible can uh, have an HRA to reimburse some of the out-of-pocket expenses. So <laughs> with that, flipping to the second side of the memo, um, I've explained what the range of um, increase is. So last year, for the first time, the town gave equal weighting between CIP and the uh, increase. And the increase was much smaller last year. It was in the 3 or 4% range from the health insurer. And last year, um, the uh, CIP for the year uh, ending September was 2.3%. Uh, so we kind of used both of those uh, factors, gave them equal weight, and we increased our premiums by 2.85%. If we did the same thing this year, um, the CIP for the 12-month uh, period ended September 30th is 1.7%. We use the CPIU and always have. Uh, so that's 1.7%. Interestingly, if you look at the breakdown in the CPIU, uh, medical components, medical um, costs altogether are running at, I think it was 4.4%. Uh, doctors were at 0.9%, uh, and uh, hospitals were at, I think, 2.3%. So uh, I think the reason medical is at 4. Point whatever it was, 4.0, 4.2, I, I didn't uh, print that sheet out. Uh, my guess is that prescription drugs and other um, you know, imaging and the like are, are um, driving that, that cost up. But anyway, the CPI, you were at 1.7%, and our average premium increase for the plans that the town employees take at 13.31%. If you just added those two together and divided by two, it'd be a 7.51% increase. As I said, last year was the only year that we gave it one-to-one -one rating. In the years prior, we always gave more weight to the CPI and less to the, to the increase. Um, a 7.5% increase is, is, you know, it's a big pill to swallow, especially given what we've done over the past five years. It used to be we, we often had double-digit increases because all we did was, you know, we paid either 100% or 90% of whatever the premium was, and if the premiums went up 10%, that meant that, you know, your, your costs went up 10%. Uh, since we uh, started this uh, method of providing insurance, the allowance, we've given greater weight to the CPI. 
So I, here's where you know it becomes an art rather than a science. So I say to myself, well, what do we do? Can can I ask the board for a seven and a half percent increase? I'm sure the employees would like it if they got a seven and a half percent increase to help them with their thirteen percent uh, average uh, increase in the premiums. I think for the taxpayers that's that's high. So. I thought about it and I said, well, if we, if we give uh, the CPI uh, three weights and, and uh, the uh, increase in the premium one, so a three to one weighting, uh, and if you do that math, you add 1.7 or multiply 1.7 by three and then add 13.31 to that and then divide it by four, you end up with a 4.6% increase. Uh, and if you gave it a 2 to 1 rate, 1 1.7 plus 1.7 plus 13.31, uh, and divided that by 3, it's 5.6%. So I looked through the uh, compensation and benefits report that VLCT just put out. They compiled a report from uh, trying to get as much information as they can from all the 251 Vermont municipalities. And uh, there's uh, probably 245 of them or so who actually have employees. Um, so I looked through this. And um, for the health insurance portion of this report, uh, 128 towns uh, reported. And of those 128 towns that reported, um, fifty-six percent of those hundred and twenty-eight towns pay a hundred percent, still pay a hundred percent of the uh, uh, health care. Now there's a wide range of plans that they offer. There's some towns like us that allow their employees to take everything and the ones that do offer it like us do similar to what we do and say here's a monthly allowance and you go and use it to buy what you want but still I was surprised that you know that's 56 percent of the reporting communities and you know that's over half the communities and I think is probably a representative sample of even the ones that didn't report uh, so 56% of the reporting communities are still paying 100% of the, of the costs. Um, if you, if you uh, drop the percentage to 90% of the costs being paid by the employer, it's still 71% of uh, those, so it goes up to 71%. So at the bottom of page two of the memo, you'll see where I have recommended uh, at least a 4.6% increase. Uh, I would have you note, however, before we say that, that um, the second paragraph from the top, in addition to the sizable rate increases that the employer and the employee will, will share, assuming that we don't pay the, you know, the 100% of everything, um, the employee and the employer are gonna share a fairly significant uh, cost increase. Employees also have additional cost shifts in these plans. So deductibles are going up, out-of-pocket maximums are going up, uh, co-insurance is going up. Uh, so, you know, for somebody like me, and I, I won't uh, get it right, probably, but in uh, 2019, uh, for instance, for for uh, wellness preferred drugs, it's $12, then 40%, then 60%. Uh, that was what is in place for 2019. For 2020, I have it here somewhere, um, you know, it's gone up for that one to, uh, uh, well, it stays the same on that one, but the, Individual out of pocket for uh, prescriptions have gone up, and even for you know if you take uh, 
high deductible plan like I do, you get money going into your HSA, but you know, I have a, a family out of pocket maximum that's about $14,000. So it's, it's a risky plan. So the employees are, are taking a hit on that side as well. So anyway, my recommendation at the table at the bottom, I recommended at least a 4.6% increase. You can see there in 2020, it's in bold. If we increase our single plan, uh, those who take a single plan from 753, 4.6% uh, goes to 788. Um, you can see the next one is 1483 and then 1535 and then for the family plan, 1950. Now the reason the 1950 is in red, um, I, I don't want to minimize the generosity of the town despite what I just said about the employees kind of having to suck it up and pay higher deductibles and co-pays as well as their share of the premium. Um, some of the communities listed in this uh, report uh, pay their contribution when they do it as we do at 85% of the platinum plan. Now, I thought that was high when I read it, but I compared what we do and we're in that range now. So 85% um, of the platinum plan for single would be 675. For the parent and child, it would be 1476. Uh, for the two-person plan, it would be 1530, and for the family plan, it would be 2150. So you can see that if we go with the 788 uh, for the single, that's 88% of the platinum plan. The parent and the child and the two-person plan are right on the money at that 85%, and the family plan is at 77%. Now, it seems to me that Blue Cross must have had they must have underpriced the family plan consider considerably last year. The 84% that is under that 1950 uh, in 2020, what that is telling me, is just a note to myself, is that a year ago in 2019, the 1863 that the family plan, plan premium was, that was 84% of the, of the platinum plan last year. Now, um, the, the platinum plan has gone up dramatically. It's almost $2,300, so they, they underpriced it. So anyway, I'll stop there. Um, the, last, the last paragraph is I'm recommending a $10 a month increase on what we give to the employees who don't take it. Uh, you'd be amazed when you look at some of our um, sister cities and towns, um, many of them give as much as $4,600 was the highest that I found. Uh, they, they offer their employees $4,600 not to take our plan because they're, they're trying to save the you know, $19,000 it costs. Uh, we've never had to do that here. Um, so, how, how many um, employees did you say are not right now, opting three, in? Right now, three employees who are eligible don't take it. And how many total employees are there? there in t I don't know right now in 2020 how many eligible employees are. We, we offer health insurance to employees who are uh, scheduled to work 30 hours a week or more. And there, in 2019, there were, there were 19 between the town and the Edward Farrar Utility District. Okay, so 16 took insurance and three opted out? Right. Bill, I have about 56%. Do you have any sort of sense of, are they smaller towns, bigger towns, a variety? Uh, they're all over a lot. Um, because because you know, intuitively, I would say maybe small towns who only have a few employees might be yeah. paying 100%. Well, you know, St. Albans City, yeah, uh, 6,800 is... people, uh, they pay 100%. Okay. St. Albans Town, they pay 85%. Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, a lot of them are smaller, Mike, but okay. you know, Jericho. That's all over the board. 5,000, they, they pay 100%. Okay. Johnson, 3,500 people, they pay 100%. What are two columns? Now, again, they may not, they may be paying 100% of, of a certain the lowest right. plan on here, but still, it's, it's 100% of, of what they're offering. And they may be, uh, they may be handling some of their other benefits and wage uh, compensation. compensation differently as well. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they may be. Either uh, that, they're, they're richer towns than we are, one or the other. Uh -huh. well, I'm not sure about that, Chris. Yeah. Uh, I don't think any town is a, is, you could categorize as a rich town. Um, you know, the challenge is that, you know, we don't have a lot of turnover here. Our employees are valuable people, and, and we're glad that we have them. But we have had turnover in some of the, uh, especially in the, the water and sewer department in EFUD, the, the sewer department in particular. Um, and that's not all about this kind of stuff. Um, but. You know, the challenge is that the unemployment rate in Vermont is less than 2%. So people are looking to get what they can get. And it, it puts employers, including municipal employers, in a, in a tough spot because people have the opportunity to, you know, go somewhere else. Now, most of our employees, I think, want to be here. Um, they, a lot of them grew up here. and. Uh, or around here, and and we don't have a ton of turnover. But um, anyway, I'll stop there and you can ask questions or make okay. comments. Could or you just explain once again why you use 85% of the as a, that's right. kind of a model? That because you there are some communities, I think, when I heard. How is that relevant to us? Yeah. Well, when I heard, I was at the, uh, in all these cities and towns, town fair back at the beginning of October. And I attended their board meeting. I'm not on the board any longer. I've been on the board for years and years. And one of, they had a presentation and they talked about the fact that they provide their employees choice to do whatever they want um, uh, for, um, to buy whatever plan they want from MVP or Blue Cross. And they, at that meeting, said, we peg our um, allowance that we provide our employees at 85% of platinum. And I raised my hand and I said, I think that that may be of concern going forward. I'm not making any comment about how much you've decided now, but if you peg it at 85% of a premium, well, if premiums go up 15% next year, your premiums automatically go up 15%. And I explained how we tied it to used inflation and the increase and so on and so forth. So I just yeah. said, what's 85%? And I was surprised we're pretty close to that. Oh, that's right. In some cases, a little bit over it. But we're not tied to it. Because it's crept up. We're not tied to it. And if it goes up next year by 12% or so, and you give a 4% increase, we're not going to be tied to it. It just happens. Yeah. That's where we are right now. Okay. Bill, so just to remind me, so in this scenario, basically, if you pick a gold plan or less, you're paying in your uh, single plan, you would be covered 100 percent is that yeah um, i interpreting that i think that that for single plans most of the plans that most of the um the allowance that we give would allow employees to choose almost anything but platinum plans i think there's a couple of them that if you get in the family plan and you're taking a gold plan you you won't have enough money to do it but uh um, if you choose a standard silver, for instance, and you're a family, um, it's 1812, and we're offering 1950. If you chose a gold plan, 
it would be 2185 and we're offering 1535 and then if you choose a platinum plan you know we're offering 1950 I mean uh, it's 2529 so um, some of the world plans are out of reach I didn't analyze every single one mark but I think that all the silver plans would be close anyway if not yeah, it looks like the silver plans, everybody would be able to. Silver, CDHP, family, 1771. Yeah, I think all the plans are available except the gold and platinum. So Mark, I, I was interested in knowing how you uh, compensate your help for health care costs. Yeah, we have a, it's basically calculated off the lowest salaried employee and then there's a calculation that basically sets the, the maximum we could charge for, or the employee contribution, which ends up being like a hundred and, I'm going off the top of my head, but it's like $115 a month or something. So that's, and then they can pick, you know, we, that's the maximum out of pocket an employee can have and then they can pick a certain, I think it's three different plans or something like that. That's where this is kind of interesting to me. I, I guess I have to remind myself every year that we do 85% of platinum versus just 85% of, of the chosen plan where it would be a slider where the employee would always have some contribution because in this scenario, potentially the employee doesn't. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's hard, uh, you know, just like the same thing for me. I'm, I haven't even seen mine yet this year, but I'm sure they're going to go up an astronomical rate again, too. Um, but yeah, that's how we do it. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to say one is better than the other or worse than another, but you've got to you've got to start from where you've been before and if you look at what we've done over the years, we have, we've bent the curve down compared to many, many other municipalities in terms of what we've offered over time. Um, and employees, if they choose a, a lesser plan, then they're gonna face those deductibles and co-pays and, and uh, out-of-pocket um, maximums that are significant. Um, you know, for whatever reason, public employees, schools, they managed to, in the old days, get these plans, and it's just, it's hard to move away from them dramatically. Uh, if you want to do that, it's your project, but uh, I, would, I would caution you about making a major move. Will, will the MVP rate schedule cover the employees at 100%? Yeah, the MVP rates are lower than this. That's what I thought. Okay. So you're asking for a decision on this tonight? I would like it if it could be. Um, if you don't, uh, you know, we've, we've got to at least We've got to make some decisions with the insurance company this week. Uh, if you want to wait until the next meeting, uh, that doesn't give employees very much time. Um, 18. If you have to wait, you can, you can wait. Mr. Fish, you got anything you'd like to say? I, I mean, I think we're being consistent with what we've been doing. It's, um, I mean, honestly, it's... Well, outside of, you know, I don't want you to take any of this personal, or it's not aimed towards employees, but I'm not going to get into spilling my guts about the impacts of what's going on in this economy that is literally putting up pe pe putting a lot of people up against the ropes. And I know that because it's affecting people who are personally connected to me. 
Um, and I quite frankly don't know what to do about it. Um, I've said this before, you know, there's people in the private sector that are not even allowed these types of benefits. And as this continues to go on at no cause of the municipalities, it continues to put people further and further in the hole. Uh, and I just quite frankly I'm at a loss as to what to do because I have people very close to me that are about ready to lose their own homes because the cost of affording to live period has become almost out of reach. And I guess, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. It, uh, it seems like uh, well, there's a certain class this? of people that are being, and I won't say protected because I don't mean it that way, but held harmless to, to a larger degree than a lot of other people. And what I guess I'm saying is it's not fair and it's really getting under my skin. Uh, well, Chris, there's a lot of things that aren't fair in yeah. society. Um, you know, the, 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 in some people's minds, the economy is as good as it's ever been. It's the best economy we've ever had in this country, according to some people. Um, you know, uh, personally, I wish that we would that we would change the system and and divorce health care from employment. It, it shouldn't be up to employers to provide health insurance, but it's the, it's the system that we have. Why do you think those companies out there are saying, we'll give you $5,000 if you take somebody else's insurance? When they do that, we should send the $5,000 to the company that's paying it, not to the person who's not taking it. But you know, everybody's trying to offload their expenses onto somebody else. It's not a fair system, but it's the system that we have to live with right now. Meanwhile, I mean, Mark, you just said you didn't know how your health costs, costs were going to increase this year, and I keep wondering how the business, the type of business that you're in can continue to absorb you know, rapid costs. Well, I believe if you're offering a plan, you, you've got to buy it through the exchange unless you have over 100 people. Uh, we don't buy through the exchange, but we have a, we buy in a buyer's group or something like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we just will have to take price eventually, right? So we'll, we'll eventually raise prices on the menus and that's how we adjust and hope that customers continue to come. That's the scary part of all of that, right? But that's that's how we adjust for increases like this. Yeah. Do you think it's a significant, um, and I think it's a nice incentive to pay people to not buy the insurance because it saves the town money, but do you think that, I mean, that's 39, that's almost $4,000 a year, if that were applied towards, um, for three employees? I, I don't know, just, do you think it would be realistic to phase that out? Or, I, I hear what you're saying and I really understand. Yeah, I, this is like a benefit to, it's, it's important to keep good employees and you don't want to nickel and dime people because then you lose them and that's one of the benefits people have of working for a town is that they get some decent benefits. Well, I resisted, I resisted offering money for those who chose not to take coverage for a long, long time. And I think it's only, it's within the last four years, I think, that we did it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, and as I said, it's, it's a 
relatively small amount, $110 a month. Um, and I think two of the employees are town employees and one is an EFIT employee that you know, it's not costing you anything. But we're all in the same in the same group for insurance purposes. You know, I did it. I had one employee to come to me and say, um, uh, you know, well, it's possible for, for me to take a single plan and my wife to take a single plan. We don't have to be on the same plan. And, you know, mm -hmm. if I took a plan that I could get an HSA with, I could put some money aside into that, the town's money. And so, you know, whether it was a, an idle threat or what, I said, well, you know, maybe it's time we got to do something a little bit. Yeah. Um, that, that's really, you know, a pebble in the, yes. in the desert sand of up above. Okay. Do you have a um, ballpark number of what this increase, if taken, I mean, I know the employees haven't chosen their, their uh, plan yet, but if well, they, it doesn't, they chose... The, it doesn't matter what plan they choose. If, if you offer this per month, I, I didn't do it. I should have, but I can do it quickly. It will take me two minutes to do it. Yeah, I didn't know what it was going to add to the overall, you know, budget, uh, in a sense, to, right. just from a health care perspective. i uh, be curious to know that. But uh, Yeah, I was wondering that as well, just what... Because, I mean, some this looks really scary, but maybe 4.6% is... Five thousand dollars, or is it? Yeah, I mean thirty thousand. Oh, so, or seventy. You know, if we're talking about any increase on our tax rate just in healthcare costs. That's uh, yeah. No, it's and, and I'm not blaming any of this on the municipality. I mean, it's a healthcare system that's being created that is just out of control. Um, It's a societal problem. You know, I'm a fiscal conservative, but I don't, I really, we have, there's just a crisis in health care. And I believe a lot of public employees, some of them choose to work in a public sector, which I'm including town officials, because of other reasons. And I think that's one of the benefits of working, you know, I know a lot of public people, they could work elsewhere and get a bigger paycheck, but they may not get the sense in doing things, you know, just by being a bean counter or something like that. And I think our town, and I think if, the, if it's not a big expense on our tax rate, I'm all for I don't think what Bill's presenting at a 4.6% increase with what rates are going out there is a lot. Just my opinion. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in this, again to see that. Yeah, number. what the raw number is. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, this is just one raindrop in a bucket of water. Right. With everything that we're continually being faced with. And uh, it, it's our whole. Every I just know of too many people out in the private sector that are really, really struggling. And, uh, mm -hmm. And it's not getting easier for them and the walls are closing in on them because more and more is getting taken out of their pockets all the time and there's no way of recovering those losses. So 2019, um, $238,000 is what we pay for health. And that, that's, there's probably a couple of other things in there, in that line, but 4.6% is uh, $10,950. Well, that does make me feel a little better. I mean, it's still an increase, but it's not. It's not like it's fifty, sixty thousand. Again, it's the, one of the drops in the bucket, you know. There's a lot of other things that are going to add up to. Right. Yeah, the, um, you know, I'll just say that the 85% of platinum, I feel like it pretty much automatically says that gold or below, you're probably going to get mostly covered. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, if we're already getting to that point, you guess 85% of platinum is always a question mark of, you know, your other towns, if they're doing that, they're pegging 
what they cover off of once, and we can see all the difference in changes year to year. So I think what right. Bill's doing is a is a is a much more difficult and consuming way to do it. Um, I'm just wondering in the future if we need to consider, and I'm not saying we should do it this year, but like, do we consider going to? We'll always cover 100% silver and below, and it's 90% of gold or something to start to. Well, again, um, I, you know, I this was a little bit different memo until I said, "Geez, I wonder what 85% of platinum is," yep. and I saw where we were. And and um, as I said, pegging your premium to whatever it is, you're going to give a percentage of that premium. Whatever that goes up, your, your cost is going to go up if it goes up 10%. So if we had pegged ourselves at 85% of platinum last year, platinum, you know, the platinum plan, um, 787. the platinum plan went up. Um, 14.38% this year. So if we had been pegged at 85% of platinum last year, we'd have a 14.83% increase this year. What I'm doing is saying, use CPI, use the rate increase. So 4.6%, if we keep doing it my way, we'll get lower and lower. We'll get further and further away from platinum. I think what happened last year, the rate increase was so low and inflation was higher than it was either the year before or now and we ended up using a one-to-one -one ratio between the two so i think we we caught up a little closer but when there's big increases if you want to tie yourself to a premium and then it goes up 15 percent right. you're kind of you're going to be changing your percentage, and then that's going to cause consternation as well. I think the way we do it is actually better. It's just that I think last year we jumped up a little bit higher than we had been before. But, you know, from my perspective, um, I'm not recommending this, but if you left it right where it is now, I think that it's a, it's a good benefit. It's something that I believe the, the taxpayers in the town is is generous. So if there's no increase, just speaking for me, you know, I wouldn't like it, but I would still be able to look people in the eye and say, you're getting a good deal. I'm not recommending that you do that, but, um, you know, so it's, 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 you have to make the choice. And I, I tried to work hard to look at it both from the employer's side and the employee's side and the taxpayer's side and a personal, uh, you know, somebody who gets the benefit. Uh, and trying to be is to, to split the baby, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're well ahead of budget seniors with this particular item. So there's a lot of other things that are going to come into play, but um. yeah, the unfortunate part about this is the way health insurance works. The, the employees are going to have to choose by about the fifth of December what plan they want, yeah. and they're going to choose based on what we're offering. And I, I don't, you, you know, you can't change it. And unfortunately, you know, we canceled last meeting, and if we had, I was away, and that's just the way it was, but. Um, you know, the insurance companies have to get approval of their rates from, it used to be called banking and insurance, I don't remember the name of the agency or the division anymore, but, um, you know, they, they push back and this information wasn't available until the second week of October, so um, I'm getting it to you as quickly as I can. Just a quick understanding too, so 788, if you choose a plan that's 560, we just cover 560, or are they getting the rest of it? No, they get the they get the 788 or the use of the 788. 788. And I didn't I didn't make the full breakdown here, but for instance, if you take I take the bronze 
CDHP standard plan. So that's the bottom plan on the left, I mean on the right. So I buy a plan and the remainder is left over and I put that, that's the town allows me to have it, I put it in an HSA and it's my money. Right. But there are some employees who don't feel comfortable with a high deductible plan. They don't, either they feel that they're, they've got some issues and they know their expenses are gonna be high or they don't like record keeping or what have you, or they're just not risk takers. They decide to buy a bronze blue rewards plan, the middle of the page uh, of the left hand column there, uh, that isn't a high deductible plan. And if they choose that plan, and they're uh, uh, a single person, we would offer 788, and they would be paying a premium of 545. And the difference between the 788 and the 545 is available to them in a health reimbursement account. But if they don't use it, that money stays with the town. So it's not that all this money goes out. For some people, and, and we've had this discussion in the past, for the employees who feel that they're willing to take a plan that has, you know, a $15,000 out-of-pocket family maximum, um, we said, well, well, we'll let you build up some money in your own health savings account to, to pay for that. For people who don't want to do it, and that's money that goes in an HSA immediately, as soon as it goes into their bank account, it's that employee's money. The town has, doesn't own it anymore, it doesn't come back to the town. Money that is set aside and is available for a health reimbursement account, if those people don't use it at the end of the year, that money comes back to the town. So not all of this money is going out. <coughs> And I, I didn't bring with me to count the number of people who take high deductible plans versus standard plans, but it, it's about a 50-50 mix, I think. Did you say the town paid to about 219000 last year? 230000 230, 230. Did you have a question? So if there's no more questions or comments in reference to this, Agenda item. Somebody would like to make a motion to authorize the increase of the recommended 4.6% monthly benefit through health care insurance to be made available to employees for the <coughs> ensuing year. And the $10 increase for. $10, $10 increase for those that do not take insurance. Yeah. Okay. Somebody wants to make I'm, that motion? I'm going to make a motion, a three part motion, uh, as per Bill's three recommendations, that the town and EFUD uh, continue to offer employees any Blue Cross or Blue Shield plan or MVP uh, through the Vermont Health Connect exchange. I also recommend increasing the monthly benefit for health insurance made to employees by 4.6% and recommend that we increase the amount to $110 per month uh, for those who do not uh, take a plan. Is there a second? I'll second. Further comments? Hearing none, the uh, motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. I want to just thank you because this is a very complicated issue. Yeah, it is. Unfortunately, I was I was listening on the way over here to the meeting a discussion about a the fact that a lot of young people are opting out and they've also defunded um, 
for Obamacare. Um, what was part of the original oh, the one years. was, it was, it was also, it wasn't just the gap years, it was the, the a mechanism to help people understand, yeah, the, to give them guidance. The navigators. Yeah, the, the that's right. Okay. And help and, people and decide which plan It was the navigators. Them. So that's all gone, and they're offering, they said if you Google, there's all these junk plans. They call them skinny plans. And then they said they could also just be called junk plans because they don't give you anything. Thank well, you. Well, I guess my other comment is, and I, and I guess it already exists in the tax stabilization fund, but maybe we need to specifically think about a health care stabilization component to that. I don't, I don't know what that would look like or how it would even work, but... Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, I don't know. Well, if our great leaders in Washington, all of them included, could uh, somehow bring themselves together to uh, solve our national debt, we wouldn't have to worry about the cost of health care because we'd be floating in money. We could pay for it easily. Maybe they could offer us all the same benefits they, they get. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's congressional health plan. Okay, the last item on the list apparently has to do with Mr. Kilgore. Greetings. <laughs> You'd like to come up and have a seat? We love your company. Yeah. So I'd like to apologize to Jeff, first of all, because when I uh, talked to you folks about my recommendation for a special town meeting with regard to the fire trucks, um, uh, I didn't even think to ask Jeff if he was available, and, and it was only I was away, and Carla texted me and said, should we ask Jeff to if you can cover the meeting. I was away when they planned the meeting. He was away when... Hope you didn't have anything. So anyway, Hope I didn't have anything planned, Jeff. Did you have to elect a new moderator? Or? Well, you could elect a new moderator, or the chairman of the board could do it, or the chairman could appoint someone to do it. Okay. Well, I'm glad. Well, I shouldn't say I'm glad. I, I hope you're available. I am. Good. Absolutely. Good. So is there anything we need to... Uh, be informed about as to how this might all shake down? Well, um, I haven't seen, I haven't spent a lot of time with a warning. Um, I don't anticipate that, well, one of the things I was thinking about is because it seems like everybody knows how to buy a vehicle, that there's typically a lot of conversation and I strongly recommend that Carla bring ballots and, ch and checklists, but she always does. I'm going to check people in as they arrive. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good plan. Make sure they're registered voters. Yeah. And then it's just the usual. It's an abbreviated meeting. I'm not going to spend nearly as much time on the rules of the road as I do at the annual meeting because it's a it's a short meeting. I don't believe that the attendance will be as great as it is at annual meeting. And I'll go through just enough of the rules so that I think we can get through the meeting. You would think, based on my kind of going over the whole scenario, that I'm when I look at things, I kind of look at them in a broader sense with everything that's going on with uh, the Harwood Union District, potential cost increases there, the fact that we're trying to, uh, you know, get some of our infrastructure issues under control, and now this having not necessarily thrown in our lap, we knew it was lurking in the background and uh, was going to come to fruition at some point. Uh, later than sooner, I think, but uh, it happens to be sooner in this case. And I'll be curious to see just how many people turn out to talk about, you know, if, if they even consider this issue and others that are surrounding them in their community that are going to, you know, continue to drive up taxes to the point where we're just going to lose, lose more people, you know, lose more local people because it seems like there's a continuation of influx and I see it in my world because I'm kind of on the front line of that part of the development, you know, the lot selling and whatnot. And uh, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a pretty active 
world out there in the real estate business of people, you know, buying new mm -hmm. lots and whatnot. And uh, and I do hear in a lot of cases where they're from, you know, and most of them. I mean, guy just moved in here from, bought a lot here from Indiana. You know, he wanted to get away from the heat. And, uh, uh, and the lots weren't, or cheap. <laughs> Find refugees. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we can go over this in a minute because it doesn't really have to do with Jeff. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you have the warning in front of you, but just as a heads up, the Article One, which is the fire trucks, is a little bit unique, and just so you know about it beforehand, um, one of the fire trucks has already been purchased. The select board at their last meeting um, authorized the purchase of one of the trucks. Um, the article uh, asks the town to authorize the select board to borrow by note for a period not to exceed five years, uh, $1 million uh, for the purposes of acquiring two replacement fire trucks through direct purchase or through reimbursement of a purchase advance from the town's capital reserve fund. So um, I talked with Paul Giuliani before the last select board meeting and explained that we had two trucks that were out of service and down. We really couldn't wait until March meeting to uh, order a new one because if you order a new one in March, it takes until about the next February before you get it. So um, it's in the other room. I didn't bring it with me. Paul um, recommended to the select board that they uh, adopt a resolution of intent to reimburse the capital reserve fund with borrowing. So he said, you'll have to explain to the voters that we made this purchase, it was rather of an emergency nature. So I just want you to know, one of the trucks has been purchased and it's, we're asking them to authorize, it will be the second truck and if they want to finance that, and then they're authorizing the reimbursement of the capital reserve fund by borrowing from what's already been spent. So it's, it's a little bit of a different situation. So if people say no to Article 1 altogether, that means we're going to buy one truck and we're going to pay for it out of the CIP and that money is going to be gone and we're not going to be able to finance that truck over five years. So the truck that you authorized to, to buy at the last meeting, um, we're going to pay cash for it when it comes. We've got enough cash in the CIP but we prefer to pay for it over, over time. Can we amend it during that meeting to lower it to half a million or whatever? Yeah, you can, you can amend it. You can, you know, um, I, I emailed Gary today. Um, I talked to him after the last meeting, and this is getting a little bit away from what Jeff is here for, but I emailed, I talked to Gary after the last meeting. In fact, he was here, and after that meeting, I, well, he was here for the regular meeting. He didn't come to the special meeting that was in the afternoon when you actually bought the truck. Um, and I said, uh, you know, there's people talking about, can we do something to stretch out the life of one of these trucks uh, to get it off of this by two in one year scenario? Uh, to your point, you know, we're, we're just a few months ahead of where we're, you know, March meeting, we're, we're going to be here asking them to buy two fire trucks. Um, and because both of them broke down, and one of them in particular. But I did ask Gary, I haven't heard word from him yet, you know, how much would it cost to just fix the tank of the truck that's leaking? And, and a follow-up to that is, are these two trucks that are down the same trucks bought the same year? Are they the same model? Yeah. Could we take the tank off of the one that has the blown engine and put that on? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. to have, if Gary could have that information available of what it's going to cost to take two and put them into, put it into, put them into one, take the motor out of the, the bad one, 
or the bad motor out of the one with a good tank, take the good motor out of the bad one with a bad tank, and stick the motor in there. Yeah, either move motors or move tanks, whichever the motors cheaper option tanks, is. Whichever is easier and cheaper. And buy us, perhaps buy us a couple of years, which would do two things, help you know, postpone the revenue spend or the spend and then possibly uh, distance our purchase time frame apart a little bit and, uh, you know, get us by for, and then again, like I said at the last meeting, it's a double-edged sword because the longer you wait, the higher the price goes. You know, you wait two years down the road, three years down the road, the truck's going to be another forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Well, are you really gaining any ground there? But that, I mean, that was, if you remember, um, that was the rationale was that this demonstration vehicle was out there and we could buy it at whatever, 465 versus 535 or whatever it was. Uh, and then, you know, he's recommending we do the same thing with the second one. We'll, we'll get that information, and I, I've tried to share, I've talked to a couple of different firefighters and said, you know, the fact that we've got these vehicles on the same year schedule is, you know, it is what it is, and it's as a result of the fact that we had two fire departments. 20 years ago, when we bought these vehicles, we had a town department and a village department. They both needed a truck, and it was cheaper to buy two trucks at the same time off the same assembly line, one and two. And, you know, people like me and you paid for one truck. And people, I don't know, were you still living in the village 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff paid for <laughs> two. two trucks. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's true. <laughs> so, um, you know, now we're in a situation where we're asking all of us to buy two trucks. But it would be nice if we could you know, ideally it would be great to get a, one of these trucks to last five years longer and then we could be on a schedule where, you know, in 2030, the ones that we bought 10 years, the, the one truck we bought 10 years ago would come up. In 2035, um, the one that we could make last five more years and then, you know, but anyway. Well, and, and um, the question mark of are we getting ahead by doing that, I think the answer is yes, if as long as the truck basically outlasts what we amortize, the, the potential cost of the truck going to zero over its lifespan, right? So if it's a $25,000 a year, basically depreciation of value, and we hope to get 20 years out of these trucks, two years is 50000 But say the truck goes up $50,000, you, you're starting that that you spread that 50,000 over the 20 years ongoing. So even if it went up to 50,000, I still think there's a way to, that it still makes sense to try to, to look at those options because I think you are saving because you're starting the 20 years, two years from now, instead of immediately starting right. another truck right now. And if we think that a viable option is to do something like that, then you know, we already own the engine. It's really mostly labor and probably not a lot of parts. It's probably not that big of an expense. Well, my bigger concern is our, the headwinds that we finally have gained on dealing with some of our infrastructure. I don't want the purchase of two of these fire trucks to have a heavy impact on lessening our ability to continue to try to gain speed on sure. our... We talked about how there are loans coming off and that yeah. the, the net impact isn't as bad as maybe it sounds. I'll, I'll come back to this, Chris. I think it's it's helpful. It, it's not taking anything away from what you just said. I agree with what you just said, but it's it's not all necessarily doom and gloom. But anyway, um, I just wanted you to know that that mm -hmm. Article 1 is a little bit odd, and I'll have with me the the Declaration of Intent that Paul had them sign, just in case anybody asks about it. Um, and, you know, I talked with him and I said, I'd like it to be as simple as possible. I didn't know if we should have two articles, but he, he felt this way, that this Article 1 did the trick. It's 
first time I've ever seen an article like this, but that's what we've worn, so we're going to have to deal with it. There'll probably be a lot of explaining, uh, especially if we decide not to buy the second truck. Uh, then we're really asking for financing, you know, to basically reimburse ourselves for the $465,000 that we we're spending to buy this truck that we chose to buy for this I mean, what possible impacts could you foresee happening if, if we ripped the Band-Aid off and just paid for one truck the first year? I mean, would that really set us back? The next couple of years, or well, or I think we can get we can get there in a minute. I I don't want to. I mean, Jeff is certainly welcome to stay for all of the yeah. policy, but I want to make sure that he's squared away. And if he decides he doesn't want to listen to local politics, he can go home. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm I'll stay longer because I think it's an interesting discussion and it helps me. Get a sense of how it's going to go in eight days. So you can follow along anyway. But I think one of the silver linings in all this is if you're a village resident, you're going to pay less than you would have otherwise. <laughs> you're right. Right. I support just what was the discussion about getting options, because I think the public needs to know, and we need yeah. to know too. Yeah, I, I explain that. Otherwise, we look like we're tone deaf, you know, yeah. oh, go off and spend a million dollars. Well, you know, and, and unfortunately, and I say this, I, I, I'm not casting aspersions at all, but um, I talked to one firefighter, and I said, look, you know, if the whole fire department shows up, you know, you're going to outweigh the whole meeting, you know, there's there's Probably. 55 firefighters, and uh, if we get 55 people at a special meeting, it's a, it's a lot. And you know, and, and the person I was talking to said, "Well, I don't think that we've ever tried to strong arm out the town into doing things." And I said, "No, I'm not saying that, but I I, I want you to look at it not just as a firefighter, but just as a general taxpayer and." Let's try to do what's best all the way around for for the fire department. You know, I I think we've got a good record of supporting a very strong fire department, and what we do pays off. I mean, there's you can count firefighters in a lot of the towns around us, and they don't add up to 55. And uh, you know, how I, I told you before that the payroll costs that we have for 55 firefighters is about $90,000. And if you had one full-time paid firefighter, you're gonna pay more than that between salary and benefits. So we're getting a good deal. And, and having good equipment is part of you know, why they yeah. sign up to do the work. So you know, it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. But anyway, Chris, you weren't here at the special meeting. I passed this out, and Jane, you weren't here either. Um, it, there's a lot of information on this page, but I want you to understand it. Um, and since I looked at it a couple weeks ago, it may take me a second to figure it out. But at the top left, in 2017, um, the town was $853,300. Um, no, that's dead to us. The town had um, total debt in 2012 31 17 of 6,098,300. That's the green column um, there, uh, four columns over from the left. So a little more than $6 million in debt. 5,245 was owed to either uh, banks or the bond bank. And 853300 was owed to us. We've done interfund borrowing. So 14% of the debt that we had outstanding, we owed to ourselves. If you come down the same columns, um, at the end of 2020, um, well, the end of 2019, the year that we're in right now, 
uh, our debt is going to be five thousand one forty two three hundred. So uh, five know, million. Yeah, five million. So almost almost a million dollars less than it was at the end of seventeen. And if we didn't borrow any more money at the end of twenty, we'd be at four point six million. And um, <clears throat> the debt to others will have dropped to uh, uh, four point four million. Uh, I think that's in 2019, and our, the debt to ourselves, uh, 5.74 million. And it's about the same ratio as it was before between the two. But the table at the top going out to the right, uh, that goes out through 2026, shows you uh, what we owed in principal and interest on each of those uh, Debt instruments that are out there. So, the uh, in 2018, we owed, we had a budget of $688,892 for principal and interest. In 2019, it's dropped to 653. Uh, if we don't borrow any more money, it's going to drop to 631, and so on. So, we're retiring debt as time goes on. Uh, and when our uh, outstanding principal goes down, even when we haven't retired the debt, interest on that lower principal is lower amount of money. So we're slowly moving in the right direction. And, uh, uh, you know, we would get from um, 6 million or 98 and 17 at the end of 2026, it would be that. 5.4 million. So at the very bottom of the page. Yeah. Now, really quick, these are net changes over previous year, right? So annual change, year. right? So, so, it's so cumulative, right. right. That's important. Right. So, um, and it, they're not huge decreases, but you know, between uh, from, 19, from 18 to 19, $35,000 dropped off. So that's about a half a penny on the tax rate in that one year alone. Um, if you go down to the bottom, and I just said, okay, let's assume we issue a million dollars of new debt in 2020, and whether it's for these, both of these fire trucks, and I, it won't be a million dollars even if we do buy two fire trucks. We don't, we won't need that much. But whether it's two fire trucks, one fire truck, some paving, whatever, if we issue a million dollars of debt in 2020, um, we won't have any payment at all in 2020. So the, the reduction from 19 to 20, which is up at the top of the page, we've got a $22,000 reduction in uh, principal and interest expense that's on the books right now. Since we won't borrow anything until 2020, we'll still realize that $22,324 savings uh, next year compared to this year. If we then refund the note, and I'm not saying we will, but if we refund the note, we're asking the voters to authorize borrowing uh, the note not to exceed five years. The law allows the select board on its own motion to convert a note into a bond. And we did that with the Perry Hill bond uh, when we paid a couple of years ago. So if we refunded the note in 2021, and we would make no principal payment, and if we were paying 4% on a million dollars, we'd have an interest payment of $40,000, would still owe a million dollars after 21, and compared to what the table shows at the top, we'll have, whether we need a special meeting before the top meeting or not, I'll, I'll as early as, possible, and I've got to get some numbers first, but as early as I can, and certainly no later than Friday, I hope, and I'd like to do it by Thursday, I'll try to get answers out to you all in an email, and maybe I'll have a recommended motion that I think works, and I'll send it all out to you. I'll, I'll include Jeff, and then if you decide that it's good, and you want to just show up on Tuesday night, 
we'll wing it. And if you decide that no, this requires more discussion, you'll have to decide that and decide when we're going to meet. Well, to decide that on Friday, though, to warn it. Yeah. Okay. On Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. Alrighty. Okay. If that's it, I take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 All approved. Aye. 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 Thank you. Mr. Girl, thank you. Thank you much. For